Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Freedom on Deck on 94.9 News Now and Stimulating Talk. Long Island Redneck here, Brian Bro, joined by the mean one, Chet Martin. What the Democrats are spoon-feeding, I'm not biting. And the fearless one, C.V. Burton. Living on the edge. Oh, yeah. Seems like uh, a lot of people are on the edge these days, especially the Democrats. Jeez. Dude, these guys, they can't figure it out, man. I don't, I don't understand what their problem is, but uh, this week they had uh, one heck of a week. But before we get into all that, man, uh, who do we got coming up? We, ha- we have Jeff Reynolds, contributor for PG- PJ Media, sorry, Freedom Works, and Red State. He's got the new book, Behind the Curtain. And if you know this name, Victor Davis Hansen. He's a Fox News contributor, author of the new book, The Case for Trump. He was just on with Tucker Carlson. He's been on with Sean Hannity a lot as of late and Laura Ingram. And then towards the end, we're going to talk to Scott Wilson, the president of the CCDL. And he's talking about some of the bills that are being presented in Connecticut on Monday. That's tomorrow and what they're all about. So we'll get into the uh, weeds with him when it comes to more gun bills Ugh. in Connecticut, but some that are f- that are pro gun bills, so that they're presenting. So it's going to be good. That's great. All right? That's great. I mean, I, you know, listen, it's uh, definitely sparked across the country. Uh, you have bills going all over the place as far as uh, gun control and everything else, and even some of the stuff that Lindsey Graham uh, came out and said. I mean, oh boy, man, it's, what it, a it, what a he. He betrayed us again. That you know, I don't I, trust him as far as I can throw him. He proved that to me this week. He really did. I mean, he is up, down, left, right, and now he wants to talk about gun red flag laws and gun confiscation and how the Dems and the Republicans can work together. We'll get into that with Scott Wilson. Let's get into the first topic. So, Michael Cohen, okay, met with Schiff and Schiff staff for over 10 hours before the House Oversight Committee hearing, uh, sources are saying. It was four different times, about two and a half hours each time. And, you know, it it, it brings something um, because he is the chair, uh, committee chairman for the, uh, for the Intelligence Committee. So, yeah. yeah. So, you know, but... That is not who is in, was investigating uh, Michael Cohen. It was the House Oversight Committee, not the Intelligence Committee. Right. So why would Adam Schiff, unless he had nefarious, um, you know, intentions to try to smear the president and to try to uh, to make it so that Cohen would say? What they wanted him to say, that if if you if you want a lighter sentence, then you're going to meet with us, and you're going to you're going to strategize with us, and we're going to tell you exactly what to say. And I guarantee you, you are going to see that he is going to get a very light sentence, and it's going to be because of this. I agree, Brian. Cohen set himself up absolutely, but don't forget it was shift. That flew to Cohen four times to New York. And what does that sound like to you folks listening out there? What's that word we're constantly hearing the liberals scream? Collusion. Yep. Collusion between the Democrat Party and Michael Cohen. And second of all, why did he sit down with only Democrats before he was grilled in front of the world? Why? Because he's a he's a he's a weasel. That's why. Because the guy is a weasel. Listen, the bottom line is he's trying to save his own skin. There, is, there is more on Michael Cohen than there is on Donald Trump. Let's put it. Let's put it that way. The guy didn't pay taxes, tax evasion, all types of other nefarious things that, and dealings that he has had in his past. So let's not play like all of a sudden he's a saint. This guy is a slime ball. He's a he's a lawyer. What do lawyers do? They stretch the law so that they can manipulate it to their advantage. Correct? Absolutely. Okay. So then, so the guy's not he's not a good guy. He's a scumbag. No, I've lied, but I'm not a liar, CV. As Mark Simone pointed out, it's not technically witness tampering. 
because Adam Schiff is a Democrat. So it's not technically witness tampering. Otherwise, it could be witness tampering. It could be suborning perjury. It could be obstruction of justice. It could be abuse of power, malfeasance, mm -hmm. and all of that. But he's a Democrat, so. Right, so if it was a Republican. So he gets a pass. Right, so if it was a Republican, they'd be going after him with Oh, yeah, they'd be, he'd be impeached. But you wouldn't be having, none of this would be happening right now if, if, if the shoe were on the other foot. The reason they're doing it to President Trump is they want to overturn the election of his presidency. Yep. That's the whole reason behind this. And they're coming up with ridiculous things now. And and second of all, on Friday, Mueller was supposed to release his findings and didn't. Yep. No one's really talking about that. No, because he's trying to he's trying to stall 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 in hopes that something comes out. You know, when this came out, about Shift and, and Cohen meeting with uh with Shift and his team. I immediately thought Loretta Lynch on the tarmac. Yeah. Cohen is Loretta Lynch on the tarmac. You know, working behind the scenes with the with with this deep state left wing uh you know operatives that are trying to take down this president at any turn that they can. They know they know that Mueller has nothing. And with the tarmac and, thing, and, and, and the tarmac thing, they're Democrats, so they get a free pass, right? But Mueller has nothing, and they know that. So, so the only thing that Mueller can do for them is to stall and delay, and say, "Hey, look, you know, you better get him in here. I have nothing. So why don't you get him in here and see if there's something? Talk with him, see what he knows, get him to spill the beans, because I, I got nothing." Well, I think another reason Mueller's not releasing his uh, findings right now is it probably uh, would end up indicting a lot of Democrats. Of course. You'd probably see Barry's name tagged along on that and Hillary's name tagged along on that. Don't forget, this was all based off uh, a spy ring that Barack Obama yep. uh, f started in Trump Towers. This is... The Democrat Party should be rounded up under the, uh, what do you call that law? It's for the mafia. I forget what it is. Not sure. Uh, because they're, they're not just the opposition party. They are the enemy of the people. They are so ugly, so nakedly biased, and act like they're above the law, and they, they have no rules, they have no laws, and they're just beating us over the head with every little, if you jaywalk, and you supported Donald Trump, you know, they could they bash you over the head with that. You and know? they're trying to tear down the fabric of this country. Yeah. Look, let's what the, face it. I mean, you know, on, on Friday they they voted to to allow illegals to to vote in elections. Racketeering. Think about that. That's what I meant to say. Racketeering laws because they're acting like um, the mafia. B exactly. But think about that. They they allow they 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 actually pass to allow illegals to vote in this country. They are not citizens. Voting is a right of American citizens, whether naturally born or naturalized. Period. It is not the right of people that are here illegally. They are taking your country away from you, ladies and gentlemen, and you are allowing it. You're doing nothing. They're doing that. They're asking for us to allow 16-year-olds to now vote. Every every Democrat in the House voted for that, and one Republican did. 16-year-olds that don't know that Tide pod, Pods aren't candies. Yep. They want them to vote. Yep. It's, yep. A, it's the most honored privilege you can have in this country. And then you see that they're delivering a message of anti-Semitism, and yes, they are. Don't tell me that she doesn't know how to talk right, yeah, Nancy. But that she has a different way of, of uh, conveying her thoughts. Nancy, they want to take your guns. They want to take your rights. Anti-Semitism, pro-illegal, and do anything to paint Donald Trump as a racist when it's their members and their mayors wearing blackface. And most of the week, Republicans in Congress are doing nothing. They are rolling over. They're, they're, they're not supportive of Trump at all. They're just letting them get away with murder. They're letting him get away with a lot, and they're doing a lot, and they're taking a lot from you. And there's another bill that they're coming out with 
uh, to allow late term abortions right up to birth. That that they are going to pass it in the House. They're what they're going to do is set the stage for 2020. They're gonna they're gonna say this is what we're about, and this is what they're about, and you're gonna get to pick. And it's going to get uglier and uglier as we get closer to... Exactly. I just want everybody to know, when we have Victor Davis Hanson on, he's going to be talking about a lot of this stuff, and he is a very brilliant man. Brian, what are we doing next? We're going to be talking about Omar's retweets. This lady is totally unhinged. Elon Omar talking and blasting Meghan McCain for faux outrage in response to Omar's remarks on Israel. And she actually goes as far as to attack the late Senator McCain. Don't turn the dial, 94.9 News Now, and stimulating talk. Welcome back to Freedom on Deck, 94.9 News Now and Stimulating Talk. If you're just joining us, thank you for tuning in. Go check us out on Facebook. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Go to freedomondeck.com. See everything that we have to offer for you there. Listen to our uh, past shows, our podcasts. And uh, we're going to get into good old Elon Omar. And, uh, yeah, I'm about sick and tired of this girl. It's got her and Rashidi t Yeah. I'm sick of them. Mm Mm-hmm. Me too. You know, she goes on, was apparently unmoved Thursday by Megan McCain's tearful remarks, uh, about her on The View. That McCain had, uh, become emotional during the ABC talk show discussing Omar's recent criticism of uh, Israel and its supporters. She said uh, Omar's remarks were hurtful to many of her Jewish friends. Megan McCain... She doesn't have any on, Jewish friends. Megan McCain goes on to say it was very da- uh, very dangerous, uh, very dangerous, uh, Megan McCain added, and I think we collectively as Americans on both sides that Elon Omar is saying is very scary to me. It's very scary to a lot of people, and I don't think you have to be Jewish to recognize that. Omar's, uh, I mean, Omar fired back, saying that Megan's late father literally sang bomb, bomb, bomb Iran and insisted on referring to his Vietnam captors as the G word. Uh, Read the post by... uh, Medhi Hassan, an Intercept columnist and uh, and an Al Jazeera host, uh, he also, lest we forget, gave the word Sarah pa- uh, gave the world Sarah Palin, so a little less faux outrage over a former refugee turned freshman representative. More offensive than this is the fact that this woman makes constant anti-Semitic remarks and tweets, and the Democrats can't call her out and you're still going to have Jewish liberals voting Democrat and anybody that's willing to do that when this is an obvious threat towards you and your people it's a shame it shouldn't be happening you've got Cortez now Alexandria coming out and saying that they need to be funded against the uh, hatefulness that's coming their way and she's talking about Ilan Homar and Rashida Tlaib well they are And, and going after AIPAC the the message that they're sending is that America is in cahoots with Israel to create wars and to bomb innocent Muslims. That's what it's all about when they go after AIPAC like they have. Yeah, but Hezbollah, let's let's keep this in mind. Care is Hezbollah in the United States. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, look it up. Care is Hezbollah in the United States. So don't tell me that Hezbollah isn't funding care in this country and care in turn is turning around because they funded Elon Omar's entire campaign practically. Yeah, they're tied to Hezbollah, they're tied to the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas and Hamas. And uh, I made a mistake. You were reading what McCain, uh, Megan McCain was saying and I said she doesn't have any Jewish friends. So, let me uh uh clarify. Clarify. I meant to say Omar doesn't have any Jewish friends, so. But well, that we know. 
the thing is, this is this is the result. This is this is the problem when you bring in foreigners from cultures that are opposite of our culture, where Sharia and communism are technically illegal in this country because we have a constitution. Our constitution is the law. So when you have representatives in government who are pushing for socialist and communist ideals, that's technically illegal. How come nobody's calling them out? Why are they even allowed to hold office? And Sharia also. Well, listen. It's, it, it's counter to the Constitution. It's illegal. Well, let me, let me play something for everybody because this right here says it all, you know? If you, if you think that they're not here in this country. Now the moment you've all been waiting for. Allahu Akbar. The first Rashida Tlaib. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you, thank you so much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. You know, we always said the Muslims are coming. Well, guess what? I think we're here. We're not only everywhere in all kinds of different governments, but mashallah, wow, we're in the United States Congress. Thank you so much for inviting me to support a civil rights organization that is around the unified fight against hate and racism in our country. Yeah. No kidding. You know, they go under that guise that they are taking the high road, that they are not the racists, that they are not the ones destroying this country. No, we're the racists. We're the ones destroying the country. They take the high road and they are the better choice. Yeah. Is it my imagination that there's a minaret on top of the World Trade Center building? No, but listen, these people have been doing this for a very long time. When she says that we're here, what she's talking about is the infiltration of Islam into Correct. our government. Into a Which Christian they've been nation. talking about, and it's a jihad. I forgot the exact term for it, but it's a form of jihad in politics that's been going on for a long time, and the cherry on top was Barack Hussein Obama. Well, now, she it, said it. He's the one that brought all of this about. But somehow, even as warped as Elon Omar is, she put out a statement uh, condemning Barack Obama. She's He's not even evil enough for her. She needs more than that. She needs anti-Semitism, and she needs a, a physical jihad in this country to quench her bloodthirst. Yep. That's what we have going on here. And if you people don't see it and don't wake up, you're going to have... Mm-hmm. What's happening in Minnesota happening here? And you got to think of this: if if somebody wanted to take over the country, the first thing that they got to do is they got to get past one big obstacle, and that's the Second Amendment. Because you're you're not gonna you're not gonna hold anybody down if they are able to fight back. Okay, so if if, if care and Muslim nations around this world want to take down America, they're going to infiltrate. They're going to get into the government. They're going to repeal the Second Amendment. They're going to take away your uh, your ability to vote. They're going to give illegals the ability to vote. They're going to pour in illegals into this country by the millions to sway the vote and to change the United States forever. And that's why Trump wants extreme vetting. And as Andrea Kay pointed out two weeks ago when she was here, uh, that you know it started under George W. Bush when he bringing in all these refugees unvetted into like Minnesota, Michigan, West Virginia. Virginia. I just yeah. saw one West Virginia. They actually moved out black and white families out of out of uh, you know low income housing and 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 they're rebuilding it and putting them in. And then Obama was depositing the refugees all along the Bible Belt to change the demographics and the uh, and the vote. Listen, we're going to come back. We've got Jeff Reynolds, contributor for PJ Media, and he's got a new book, Behind the Curtain. Don't you dare go anywhere. Welcome back to Freedom on Deck, 94.9 News Now and Stimulating Talk. WJJF on your FM dial. 
Connecticut, Long Island, and Rhode Island. You're rocking with the best. Make sure to go to freedomondeck.com. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter while we're still on there. And you can go follow our channels on BitChute and YouTube. Subscribe there. All our backtracks are featured for you right on the website. Freedomondeck.com is the one-stop shop for your listening pleasures for all you radio heads out there. Our featured guest on today's program is here to discuss his new book, Behind the Curtain, Inside the Network of Progressive Billionaires and Their Campaign to Undermine Democracy, Mr. Jeff Reynolds. Jeff, welcome to Freedom on Deck. Well, thanks for having me, guys. This is going to be a blast. So tell our listeners what Behind the Curtain is all about. Yeah, so what I want to do is uh, I wanted to... um, connect the dots between all of these uh, subversive and uh, progressive campaigns that we see. I live in Portland, Oregon, so I was ground zero when Antifa was shutting down streets and Mm. creating those no-go zones in our uh, downtown core. Um, I want to connect the dots between them and uh, the foundations and who's funding them and and dig in to see what these billionaires are doing, uh, the Soros's and the Steyer's and the Michael Bloomberg's and all those folks and what they're doing to uh, push this radical agenda. So that was the objective with the book, is to figure out who's actually paying for it and who's dictating the terms of the campaign. And, you know, Jeff, we all know the name George Soros. You know, you hear it all day. And Tom Steyer. Everybody knows about them. And we know that they flood campaigns and organizations on the left with billions of dollars. But how do they organize their dollars and to uh, fund these organizations, Jeff? Well, so they, they organize it in several different ways. They have this vast network of nonprofit foundations that are uh, set up as charities, but they will also uh, give grants to these um, educational uh, foundations that are pushing these, these campaigns. So there's this, just this enormous number of, uh, of foundations. A lot of folks are familiar with, like, Rockefeller Foundation and Ford Foundation, but there are, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of these things on the left that are doing that, and they organize their campaigns by coming together several times a year, these donors and the people that run the foundations, to coordinate what they're doing, and uh, your buy-in for what these kind of the Democratic Alliance, and then this one, one that's run by David Brock at Media Matters, and you have to, in order to be a member, you have to pledge to give at least $200,000 every year to some progressive cause, whether it be uh, green energy or, or climate change. Black Lives Matter or those kinds of groups. Jeff, um, everybody talks about George Soros, but I, I keep mentioning Jeff Bezos because he has six times the wealth of George Soros, and he bought the Washington Post as a hobby just to bash Trump. Uh, yeah. Is he is he financing other things that we may not know about? Uh, not yet. He's not as, as heavily as involved. And, and there's actually a, a bunch of these billionaires that are you know nowhere near the level of Jeff Bezos. It, it, he he started to dabble, but um, uh, th- these other guys are really just dedicating everything that they have to these campaigns. And a lot of it goes back to the Warren Buffett giving pledge, where uh, these guys with massive wealth uh, pledge to give away at least half their uh, wealth during their lifetime to, to charity and that sort of thing. So that's where a lot of this stuff comes from. Jeff, the book explores the world of dark money and influence. What is dark money? Some people may be asking. Yeah, you know, that's more kind of a euphemism because uh, we on the right, uh, you know, the Republicans and conservatives are always uh, accused of being, you know, having dark money uh, push our campaigns and that uh, we're beholden to our billionaires, nor the party of billionaires and millionaires where they're the party of the little guy. And so I use that sort of tongue in cheek because dark money is simply money that's donated to a foundation that then gives out grants. So um, it's not really, it's not the, um, it's, it's a first amendment issue, right? Right. But at the same time, they, they use this massive network of of funding uh, and and dark money uh, to bash us for being beholden to dark money, which is really hypocritical on their part. We have Jeff Reynolds, contributor to PJ Media, Media Equalizer, FreedomWorks, Red State, and more, and also has released in February his new book, Behind the Curtain, Inside the Network of Progressive Billionaires and Their Campaign to Undermine Democracy. Um, 
Jeff, the book goes into detail about how the left will go to great lengths to overturn the 2016 election results with a shadowy network of nonprofit organizations and consult firms with the help of very compliant media. Who exactly are these organizations and firms? Uh, they're almost too numerous to count, but they're all very much involved in the resistance. The resistance is, I mean, a lot of people were pretty upset about the results of the election, and most people were pretty surprised. Uh, but uh, it, uh, they weren't really organized into this sort of, we're never going to let Donald Trump be normalized, and we're never going to let Donald Trump be accepted as the American president. But that's what, you know, D David Brock and, and a lot of other folks brought all these donors together uh, coincidentally enough, on um, uh, Inauguration Day. And they have this uh, memo that they put out at this conference called The Plan to Kick Donald Trump's Butt. And it's uh, in it, they, they brag how they're going to uh, organize the resistance. They're going to uh, push for impeachment. Before the guy even got inaugurated, they were pushing for impeachment. Uh, and and they're, uh, they're putting all this uh, effort together and uh, and funding all these campaigns, and it's it's coordinated by this small cabal of folks that get together. You know, like I said, uh, they have to pay two hundred thousand dollars to the uh, lefty charity of their choice just to be members of this group, and and they have a whole vast. I mean, the the memo, uh, the planning memo is like forty pages long. Wow. J um. J you know, last January you wrote a piece in PJ Media detailing billionaire donor of the left, Ed Buck, who had two dead black males found in his house. Um, was he protected because of the fact that he's a donor to the Democrat Party? And he is he detailed anywhere in behind the curtain? Uh, unfortunately, he didn't get on, get on my radar until after I wrote the book. But uh, yeah, he's there, there's definitely protection going on. He's in California. He's in Hollywood. So the California um, Democrats and, and the people that pull the strings for sure uh, put this under the rug I, it, because he had a previous issue with, a, you know, one one dead black kid uh, in his bedroom and uh, that never got prosecuted. The DA dropped the charges and then he end, ended up having another one happen here just a few months ago. And now, uh, you know, it, it, coincidentally enough, the um, the gay rights groups and the um, uh, minority, you know, like Black Lives Matter, and, and those folks are saying, "Well, wait a minute, why isn't this guy? Why aren't we touching this guy just because he's a Democrat, right?" So they're actually starting to protest, and that's actually caused the DA to open charge or open an investigation into this. It's, it's bizarre how. And, and I give you, uh, I wrote another article uh, about a guy named Terry Bean up here in Oregon who, for six years, got away with this, um, this sexual abuse of a 15-year-old boy. Uh, and, and never had uh, he had, had the charges dropped. So, I mean, there's all kinds of this stuff where they work together. And, and the more you peel back the layers of the onion, the, the worse it looks. And, uh, you know, Jeff, it's good that some of these groups are questioning the Democrat Party, but it's amazing that here you have two black gay young men that should be, you would think the left would be, stop, you know, kicking down the door in order to defend uh, to to defend them and to go after somebody that could have possibly murdered them, but the media totally turns a blind eye to it. Doesn't it just show that they really don't care about these the the folks that they claim to to uh, behold in such a almost um, almost on a pedestal, Jeff? Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right, and um, it, you're right to be outraged about this because this really is outrageous. And it, it's amazing that it never goes anywhere. But uh, you look at Bill Clinton, you look at Harvey Milk, you look at Barack Obama, you look at these guys who have done some pretty horrific things in their lives, and uh, they it, it gets swept under the rug because they do so much to advance the progressive cause that, that their crimes can be ignored. And that's what happened in the case of Ed Buck, and that's the case, uh, what happened in the case of Terry Dean. And it's not only Ed Buck that is uh, a mega donor for the Democrats that's been engulfed in a scandal. Jeff Epstein, who everybody knows, was recently convicted for his crimes of exploitation of underage girls. These donors seem to all have some very disturbing skeletons in their closet. Why do you think that is, Jeff? 
You know, I don't know. I, it really disturbs me, though, because uh, – and I keep going back to my local example of Oregon because that's what I know. We have, we've had so many politicians, Democrat politicians here, that have had sex, sexual uh, um, controversies that were not only swept under the rug, but, like, everybody knew about it. Like, in the case of uh, Neil Goldschmidt, our, our uh, Democratic governor from the 80s, he had a 13-year-old girlfriend for years, and everybody knew about it. Uh, the, the Oregonian newspaper knew about it. Yeah. The state police covered for him. I mean, it's 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 amazing how these people get away with this, and, and the, the levers of power just protect these people. Well, one of the senators in Connecticut where we're heard, uh, Dick Blumenthal, met his wife when she was 16. And it's a well-known fact. And he was, at the time, in politics when that happened. And was got... he in Vietnam at the time? Yeah, that was after Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> da Nang Dick, as uh, President Trump likes to call him. That's right, that's right. Yeah, well, that's a whole that's a whole other subject for another time. Um. Are groups like Black Lives Matter or the Women's March Movement or uh, La Raza Care, are they subject to taxation or are they tax exempt? They're tax exempt. They're 501c3s or c4s, depending on how they organize themselves. If they're tax exempt and you have a group like Black Lives Matter, which has been seen screaming pigs in a bank blanket, fry them like bacon, breaking shops around Baltimore when they got involved after the uh, the death of uh, a black Baltimore man. And they're creating this type of violence where you could almost label them a terrorist group. How the hell are they tax exempt, Jeff? It's mostly through lack of enforcement. I mean, you would have somebody would have to file a complaint with the IRS and, and claim that they are not uh, doing the, the uh, work that's in their uh, mission statement. Now, you can go to any, all of these guys have their uh, financial documents on their website. The, the, the most uh, reputable charities will have their IRS Form 990s and their Articles of uh, uh, Consolidation or, or Organization uh, and their annual kind of uh, um, uh, fiscal statements. And that's the kind of stuff that I was digging through to write the book. And mm. um, I, I was able to rely on the research of some other folks that did this previously, too. But um, so they, they go and they'll tell you what their, their uh, purpose is. And then, you know, on 501c3, you have to have a certain you can only do like 10 to 20 percent of your activity is politics. Uh, 501c4s can only be like 40 to 50 percent of it. You know, 51 percent of their activity has to be education. So, I mean, there's all these these sort of vague kind of rules of thumb that make it really hard to prosecute. Are these donors going to ratchet up their spending coming up with the 2020 election? What do you think? Oh, I don't think there's any question of that. I think you already saw it in 2018 when they took the House and they, they ran uh, congressional candidates mostly on a, a, a platform of impeachment of Donald Trump. So, yeah, I think it's 2020 may be the most insane election we've ever seen in the United States. All right. Everybody, that was Jeff Reynolds. He is contributor to PJ Media Media Equalizer. And he's got the new book out behind the curtain. Jeff, tell everybody the website that they can go and check out for you and where they can go and buy the book. Yeah, so I just set up a unique uh, URL for that. It's called whoownsthedems.com, and that directs right to my author page on Simon & Schuster. But uh, I want everybody to know that uh, the Dems are owned lock, stock, and barrel. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Jeff Reynolds, thank you for for everything you do, sir. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Everybody, make sure you go and buy Mr. Jeff Reynolds' new book, Behind the Curtain, inside the network of progressive billionaires and their campaign to undermine democracy. But listen, we're going to be coming back, and we've got to talk a little bit about Manafort being sentenced to four years. Will he get a pardon? Will Trump go down that avenue? Come back to FOD. Welcome back to 94.9 News Now and Stimulating Talk. 
We hope you are enjoying the show. Got to be talking about Paul Manafort. Man. Man. Manafort. Paul Manafort was sentenced to nearly four years in prison. A federal judge on Thursday sentenced Paul Manafort to nearly four years in federal prison for financial crimes in the first of two sentencing hearings for the one-time Trump campaign chairman, a term substantially less than <laughs> prosecutors thought. <laughs> yeah, they wanted 25 years. Yeah. Ridiculous. Uh, U.S. District Judge uh, T.S. Ellis' uh, decision came more than a year after Special Counsel Robert Mueller secured uh, a 18 count. We were just talking about that. Uh, how guilty many, of how only many counts. Guilty 18 of only eight. count indictment. Uh, against Manafort on charges re- uh, related to tax and bank fraud, which let's just make it clear, not Russian collusion. <laughs> no, that's never addressed. Also, when they talk about Manafort, no, never has nothing to do with President Trump either. Nope. And you know, and look, I think he, um, I think he got off as light as as he possibly could have. I think. You know, with with what he was being faced with, let's let's put it this way: um, Cohen has done the exact same thing that he has. Tax fraud, the whole nine yards. He, he was convicted of it. Yeah, he didn't pay his taxes. Tax fraud, amongst other things. I'm sure if Mueller put in as much effort to looking into Michael Cohen as he did Paul Manafort, Paul, uh, Michael Cohen would be facing 25 years. Well, Michael Cohen played, he played with the Mueller investigation. He was threatened. His wife was threatened to be locked up for 30 years. Yeah, he cooperated, right. And he cooperated because his family was going to be drugged down with him. You know, as far as Cohen goes, he's a snake. He's a lawyer. He's a no good you know what. But I understand why he did it. I get it. Your wife was going to be thrown away and locked away. And Robert Mueller is a very evil, evil person that gets what he wants by indicting people for things that they never did or rewriting the laws. Manafort has experienced this too. However, what's happened here is he's gotten a light sentence, I think, mainly because he cooperated also. Everybody says he didn't cooperate with the, the... No, there was nothing for him to cooperate with. When they're saying that he didn't cooperate, what do you want him to do? There's nothing to uh, tag to Trump. This has nothing to do with him. So he got four years because of his cooperation and people on N- MSNBC like Chris Hayes are having panels on that are saying, oh, it's because he's a white man. Yeah. That's the excuse. Well, listen, you know, it's not over for Paul Manafort because he is going to be sentenced on on separate charges, which are lying to investigators. Right. So he's he's got to face that music, too. So his his time may not necessarily be over. And the other thing is that like you like you were saying, it might not be is is that it may not just be four years. And, you know, it depends on how prosecutors want to play this, because his sentences between the two sentences could could run concurrent or consecutively. I now, if they think, run consecutively, that means he's going to be doing a lot more than four years in jail. I don't think he was even given a light sentence. It was just a lighter sentence than the twenty five years. The uh, than they wanted. The M- Mueller counsel. That's what was, I was asking. That's what I. Meant. And he was given uh, time served, so it's only going to be like three three more years. However, he's going to be sentenced to, on uh, other accounts. But you know, eighteen counts and only and only convicted of uh, uh, of eight. I mean, that that just shows the overzealousness of the Mueller team. And from what I understand with Paul Manafort is when they locked him away, you know, he had no contact with anyone. He was in solitary confinement. He was in the hole, in the brig. Yeah. Yeah, why? Over over uh, uh, tax questions? I mean, everybody, every rich person... uh, Fudges on the tax on their tax. Uh, uh, yeah, returns. they do, That's and they've sure. already determined that that solitary confinement is cruel and unusual punishment. That's why there's a, many states have restrictions on the amount of time that somebody can actually stay in solitary, and f- nine months. Well, and to do it to somebody that's 
clearly not a violent felon. Right. The, the only way I can see you doing it is to protect him. And I don't know if where he was locked up, he necessarily needed to be protected. The only reason that Paul Manafort was indicted and is, is putting in into jail, into the system, is because of his association with Donald Trump. Exactly. There's so many Democrats that we talk about fudging their taxes and what they, they can and shouldn't do that do it and aren't prosecuted and, over the same crimes. And what about this? Is that, you know, there's so many people that have been in the same exact spot, same exact crimes, who have Get a slap on who, who, who are out on bail, who have an ankle bracelet or whatever. Why was he in prison? Why was he being held? Why, because Mueller wanted to put the screws to him, and by having him in prison, by throwing him in solitary, he, he you know, it's, it's, it's a psychological game that he's playing. Usually, yeah. usually on tax fraud things like this, they get a slap on the wrist, they get a fine. They don't, they don't spend nine months in jail. Al Sharpton much still less owes four. freaking money to that he hasn't paid in back taxes, and the guy hasn't even been charged with a thing. But Manafort's been ruined. He's been, <laughs> That's he's true. been bankrupt. His family's been destroyed. They had to move. He has nothing. He's and, a broken man, and I hope Trump pardons him. And how does Hillary Clinton get away with what she got away with in Haiti? When the Clinton Foundation started a fund to create a hospital and they took $146 million from contributors, from outsiders, from third parties, they pocketed all the money. Nothing was ever given to the Haitian people. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a hospital built, mm -hmm. but Chelsea had a hell of a wedding that summer. Oh, yeah. talk about a Ponzi scheme. Talk about a Ponzi scheme and nothing happens from no. a woman that embezzles money from a third world nation that can't get out of their own way because she's a democrat and there's there's a double standard no. and there was probably child trafficking coming out of haiti too that I they think, took advantage of i think we can clearly say that the clintons are world uh leaders so they're part of the elitists i'm sure they've been to many bilderberg group meetings that's the whole point here. It was the association with Donald Trump that got Manafort into the situation that he was in. It had nothing Correct. to do with Russian collusion. Right. He wasn't a part of his campaign. He wasn't making deals between Trump and any other businesses out there. He was just an associate of President Trump. It had nothing to do with Russia. I didn't uh, even know if Paul Manafort could point to, point Russia out to you on the map. I'm just wondering if Trump is waiting for the election to be over and uh, for him to take the gloves off. Sure. I don't know. We'll find out. We'll see. But listen, we're going to come back with Victor Davis Hanson. He's a Fox News contributor, author of the new book, The Case for Trump. You may have seen him on with Tucker Carlson a few weeks back. Big guest, national guest. Leave it here. 94.9 News Now and Stimulating Talk. Welcome back to Freedom on Deck on 94.9 News Now and Stimulating Talk. Connecticut, Long Island, and Rhode Island, WJJF on your FM dial. Thank you for being with us on your Sunday. Go to freedomondeck.com. And on freedomondeck.com, you can link to our Facebook, like us there, follow us on Twitter, and sign up for our BitChute and our YouTube channels where you can listen to our past shows and any of the midweek podcasts that are released. It's a one-stop shop for you. Listen, our featured guest is an expert on ancient warfare and a professor of classical studies. He is the Martin and Lily Anderson Senior Fellow Residence in Classics and Military History at the Hoover Institution, Stanford University, a professor of classics emeritus at California State University and a nationally syndicated columnist for Tribune Media Services, author of the new book, The Case for Trump, Victor Davis Hanson. Mr. Hanson, it's an honor to have you stop by the program, sir. Thank you for having me. 
So your new book, The Case for Trump, was released on March 5th, just a few days ago, and it's garnered plenty of attention already. Tell our listeners about the book, sir. Um, well, I'm very happy. I tried to not write a, uh, a book that was seen as a rah-rah support of Trump, nor one of these unhinged attacks on him, but I wanted to have a little distance. I could say that I had never gone to the White House. I don't know him. I never met him. I have never asked for a job or been offered one. So I was trying to do it as an analytical historian to say why he got elected, how well has he done, and what are the what's the prognosis for the next two or three years. So what is the prognosis in your opinion? Well, I think we forget that in 2016 it wasn't Donald Trump the person. It was Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton. Yeah. And that's always true in elections. And whether America likes it or not, it'll be Donald Trump versus an agenda that we haven't seen in 90 years. It's going to be uh, reparations, the Green New Deal, the Medicare for All, uh, a wealth tax, 70 to 90 percent income tax bracket, the abol abolition of ICE, and probably something close to legalizing infanticide. That's a pretty hard left agenda, and Trump will be making the argument that it's my record between 2017 and 2020 versus a socialist protocol, and I'm the only thing between you, American voters, and socialism. And the Democratic Party is going the whole 1972 McGovern route, it seems to me. So I think his chances are pretty good, especially if he can avoid a, a recession and an optional war overseas. Professor, should President Trump make the infanticide issue a central component of her, his campaign message as to to beat the Democrat Party in 2020? Yeah, I think he should, because we all knew that that was what they believed, but they were always never called on it. And now in this new frenzy that they're in, to say that you're not for that will lose you the nomination. So, yeah, I, I think he is. There used to be two red lines for pro-life conservatives if a pro-life conservative said there would be no abortion no, no abortion whatsoever in the case of rape or incest he faced trouble and if you were a pro-lifer and you said that there would be partial birth abortion or infanticide or even abortion when the fetus was viable out of the womb I'm not talking about the moral issues I'm just talking about the political and that was suicide so they're going well beyond that uh, taboo the Democratic Party they're talking about a baby who's born and then, yeah. according to the Virginia governor, they're going to have a discussion about what to do with him, as if he doesn't have constitutional-based rights. Yeah, it's frightening. It's absolutely frightening. Uh, Professor, the media prefers to give more attention to President Trump's tweets and uncouth commentary than actual results from his policies. Shouldn't they give him credit where credit's due vis-a-vis uh, -vis the economy, jobs being up, black employment uh, black unemployment numbers being down, these th types of things. Th they'll mention it in passing, but they don't They don't give it much time. Yeah, I, I think the media this time around is fused with the progressive movement, the Shorenstein Center at Harvard, which is a liberal analytics um, think tank, has said that 90% of the coverage of Donald Trump has been negative. And so I think the media, and we see it with CNN, you know, I mean, some of their hosts have been fired for using pejoratives and Reza Aslan and Kathy Griffith with the head and other people and they've had to fire a number of uh, reporters but I think the point is to drive down his popularity ratings into the high or mid 30s when a president gets to that level then he's impeachable which remember is a political act mostly it's not necessarily a legal act so that's what the media's constant drum media that was what the initial suits were you remember about the voting yeah. machines yeah and we had to try to pervert the electoral college the Mullimans clause the 25th amendment psychodrama there was a Mueller investigation the McKay coup anonymous editorials all of that stuff is trying to drive down his popularity so that he's vulnerable to an impeachment hearing if, if he stays at 45 or above they can't impeach him because it's political suicide We've got Professor Victor Davis Hansen on with us and his new book, The Case for Trump, was just released a few days ago. Now, Professor, going into uh, impeachment and what some Democrats keep talking about, you had Rashida Tlaib, who was 
recently saying they are going to go forward with articles of impeachment. But then you have some on the Democrat side that are saying, hold on, wait a second. Let's see what comes out of this Mueller investigation, which is a whole nother story. But what side is going to win the day on the Democrat side? The side that wants to go forward with this impeachment or the side that says hit the brakes? I think it depends on what the Mueller investigation alleges. If they say that there's no collusion, but there are if there are vulnerabilities or exposures that the Southern District of New York federal court might look into, then that'll be their compromise. Pelosi and Schumer and Dick Durbin and the rest of the old guard will say, wait, we're going to turn this over to 60 or 70 congressional investigations, and then we'll indict him as soon as he gets out of office, but we'll weaken him by continuing these constant uh, investigations. I mean, we kind of forget the guy, Trump is 72 years old. He's not necessarily a paragon of um, athletic health or diet. He gets up every morning after four or five hours of sleep, and he hears that they've attacked his wife, his daughter, and himself, not just last year, but 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years. They accuse him of everything in the world. Michael Cohen, who's a convicted liar, is taken as the gospel. So that's a psychological pressure that it's sort of like an, the metaphor would be an eggshell, and they keep thinking they're tapping it at every little point, and they don't see very big fissures, but at some point, the whole thing's going to implode, and Trump will either be ill, or something will happen to him, or he'll quit, or he'll, he'll just crack up. That's, that's what, I think that's the effort, to make life so unpleasant for him that either he, he has no popularity or he'll be physically incapacitated. It's a lot of pressure. We forget that. It really is. I couldn't do it. You couldn't do it. We couldn't get up every morning and face that day after day. No, absolutely not. Uh, we have Fox News contributor Victor David Han- Victor Davis Hanson on the phone with us, and he has the new book, The Case for Trump, out. Now, he's the first elected president without a military or political background. Why do you personally think America decided that he was ready to be the leader of the free world, Victor? Well, I made the argument in the book that there were about four or five issues that he added to the tr- he's a traditional conservative at least he ran as one if you think of deregulation and tax reduction and reform and strict constructionist judges but he added uh, four or five issues that were quite different from the other 16 gifted candidates and they were geographical as well they were um, that china was not destined to take over the world like we all sort of shrugged and said can't stop it that they were cheating and that we were going to address that mercantile abuse and patents, copyrights, dumping, technological appropriation. And then he said, you know what, we're not going to get cheap labor for conservative businesses and we're not going to have identity politics open borders. We're going to close the border and have legal measures, meritocratic reverse immigration. That was the second one. And then he, he also said the industrial heartland is not, don't write it off that Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, these are great places. And they didn't fail because everybody started to take opiates. They failed because trade policies gave our rivals edges in manufacturing. But, you know, we have cheaper power than Japan or Korea or Germany, and we've got good workers. There's no reason we can't, with proper policies, reindustrialize. And then the fourth issue was we've never, recently at least, I should say recently, we haven't tra- translated tactical success on the battlefield in Afghanistan or Iraq and Libya or Syria into long-term strategic advantage. So he was saying that we're not going to do that anymore. He's going to be more of a Jacksonian, don't tread on me, hit back, but not nation build. Those issues appealed to those states where the election was going to be decided. It wasn't going to be decided in New York or Texas or California. But he, he said he could flip those people with a message that Romney and McCain and Bob Dole had not embraced. And he was right. Professor, when President Trump went to have his meeting with Kim Jong-un in Vietnam for talks of putting down nukes, the media seemed to take great joy over the fact that our objective fell a little bit short. Is a loss for Trump more important than a win for the country, uh, country when it comes to the mainstream media? Oh, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that's why they timed the Cohen hearings to coincide with that. I mean, if Barack Obama was in Europe trying to negotiate in Geneva the Iran deal, and all of a sudden the Republican House in 2015 called in Tony Resco and said, 
did you or did you not give a land deal to Obama, and did he ever pay taxes on that gift? Then they brought in Reggie Love, the bag man, and said, did or did not Obama play spades and brag about playing cards and not being in the war room during the bin Laden raid, as you've testified? If you did things like that, it would really hurt Obama and his negotiations. That was the p purpose of it. They, they, they feel any means are necessary to abort the Trump presidency because they claim a higher moral um, agenda, that of you know radical equality of result. Once you go down that road, you can justify anything to destroy someone. We have off author of the new book, The Case for Trump, Victor Davis Hanson, on with us. He's also a Fox News contributor. You may have seen him. On with Tucker Carlson and many others. Professor Hanson, we keep hearing that the Mueller investigation is winding down. They were supposed to be releasing some of the findings actually on Friday and that they will only end up releasing part of their findings to the public when they do. You know, what findings will they present? Because as time goes on, it seems like they have nothing that has to do with any kind of Russian collusion, which was why we were supposed to have this inv investigation open up in the first place. And what could they be withholding from us? Could this be uh, some dirt that points towards the Democrats, perhaps Barack Obama and, and Hillary Clinton? I think more they're they're doing two things. They're going to wink and nod and say that when he talked to Obama, um, call me to be nice on Flynn, that possibly sort of kind, kind of be interpreted as obstruction of justice, which it isn't. And then when he fired Comey, that was obstruction, which it isn't. And then they're going to say there was a non-disclosure agreement and there was campaign finance. But it's it's not going to be substantial. But remember, they said the Mueller investigation was going to be wrapped up by December 15th. Mm. So the longer they keep this going, the Trump lawyers say to Trump, you can't release all these documents, so you have to release them with heavy redactions because we know that because we don't know how they're going to affect you. Once the Mueller investigation is over with and he's exonerated and I think he will be then Trump can go back and release the unredacted FISA applications he can go back and look at all of the unmasking that was been redacted most of them hasn't been released he can go through transcripts that we haven't heard of Bruce Orr and, and Comey and the Cage congressional investigation all that can come out I think we're going to learn that the FBI and the DOJ deliberately diluted a FISA court to spy on an American citizen, they inspired, they inserted sp at least one spy, maybe two, into a presidential campaign. Uh, they requested that names of Americans be unmasked and then leaked to the press. Uh, we know that Andrew McCabe lied in federal investigators. James Comey on 245 occasions said he didn't know or didn't remember under oath. There's a lot of criminal exposure there. Uh, James Baker, the FBI counsel, did the same. Bruce Orr did not disclose on a federal form. His wife was working on the dossier. So I, I think that, that kind of liberates, the release liberates Trump to go back and just say, you know what, I'm going to release everything, and you guys deal. And then I think the onus will be back on the, the accusers will be the accused. But as long as you drag Mueller out, then you hang that over, and any good lawyer will tell Trump, you know, don't release that, don't on redact that because we don't know what the legal contortions could be in six months from now. So he's been very conservative. Victor David Hans, Davis Hanson, Fox News contributor and author of the new book, The Case for Trump. Victor, tell everybody where they can go and get the book. Yeah, you can go to, I think the best place is in Barnes & Noble. It's in Walmart. You can go to uh, Amazon. You can go to victorhanson.com or National Review has an ad. Any of those outlets. Everybody, that was Victor Davis Hanson. Once again, go and pick up the book, The Case for Trump. You won't be disappointed. Listen, we're going to come back. Michael Savage and Elizabeth Warren, there's, you certainly wouldn't think of those two sitting on a side of an issue together, but they think Amazon should be broken up as a monopoly. We're going to talk a little bit, bit about that when we come back. Welcome back to 94.9 News Now and Stimulating Talk. Redneck here, the fearless one, and the mean one. Mm -hmm. Senator Elizabeth Warren. I tell you what, you know, whenever the Democrats open their mouths, it's always something great. 
Usually. <laughs> Usually. But be- believe it or not, she actually makes some sense here. Elizabeth Warren, who is from Massachusetts, for anybody that doesn't know, obviously everybody up in Connecticut knows where she's from. The tribal. But championed tribal, another. The tribal side of Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> a broken she clock was. is right twice a day. <laughs> oh, man. Right. Uh, anyway, championed another expansive idea on Friday evening in, a, in front of a crowd of thousands in Queens. What's she doing down here? Oh, no good. We've already got Talking enough about, corrupt Democrats down here. It's funny how, you know, AOC, you know, with Amazon pulling out of the city and all that other stuff. And, now, and now and now Elizabeth Warren comes out of her teepee down to Queens <laughs> to, to, to champion a, uh, the idea of a regulatory plan aimed at breaking up some of America's largest tech companies, including Amazon, Google, Apple, and Facebook. Uh, at a rally in Long Island City, the neighborhood that was to be home to a major new Amazon campus, but thanks to AOC and some of the local leaders in Queens, that's not going to happen. Miss Warren laid out her proposal calling for regulators who would undo some tech uh, mergers. You know, I got to tell you, it's 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 amazing that they 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 shoot Amazon in the foot. Uh, they want to shoot Facebook in the foot and Twitter and all these other ones. Uh, but yet they love the fact that they silence conservatives. Correct. They love the fact that they um, no longer have 25,000 jobs in Queens. I think that's why this is all big talk from Elizabeth Warren. Just like her bloodline. Big talk, going to go nowhere. So you're saying this is one... 1,024. Because, yeah, because I agree with her here. There is an issue with corporate corporations and monopolies like Google that corner the market on the internet, basically. Yep. And apps. you're not, and apps, and you're not able to promote anything th- that goes against their belief system. And they kill and silence everybody that does. But yet they're going against the Constitution belief system, which are rights. Right. So I so, sort of somewhat agree with... I've heard Michael Savage talk about this before, CV. And they... You know what it is? It's unfair business practices. I'm I'm not... You know, I'm for the liaison fair capitalism, which means hands-off capitalism, but they practice unfair business practices like um, denying apps to Gab, for instance, right. because they think Gab is like a conservative... Uh, website. That's my whole point. You're not able to get a, prom- you know, promote an app, and that's an issue. Listen, we're going to come back. We have Scott Wilson. He's the president of the CCDL, and he's coming to talk about some bills that are going to be, be presented in Hartford tomorrow. You're not going to want to miss it. Stay right here. 94.9 News Now and Stimulating Talk. No games played here. This is Freedom on Deck on 94.9 News Now and Stimulating Talk. WJJF on your FM dial, Connecticut, Long Island, and Rhode Island. You're rocking with the best. Don't forget to go to freedomondeck.com. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Sign up for our bit shooting YouTube channels. And everything else we have to offer you is right there at your fingertips. It is a one-stop shop for Freedom on Deck. And we've had a great show so far. We've had some good guests, but we have another guest coming on with us now. And he's an old friend to the program. He actually was interviewed by us over three years ago before we were put on 94.9 News Now on our podcast at the time, believe it or not. He's the president of the CCDL, Connecticut Citizens Defense League, Mr. Scott Wilson. Scott, welcome back to the program, sir. Thanks, Chet. Thanks for having me on, guys. Appreciate it's it. it's been too long, man. It feels like sometime a year and a half ago is probably the last time we had you on. Yeah, and you know, it just goes to show the you know the depth of your uh, audience and just the fact that you've had some tremendous guests on, and you, you've 
you know, gone very broad with the, the, your, your list of topics. And, uh, but it's, it, like I was saying to you off air, it does feel like uh, old times because I remember when you guys were just starting out with your, you know, your platform and you, you were kind enough to have me on. And uh, so it feels uh, like a privilege to be there with you guys almost from nearly the, the very beginning. Well, when we went to the, one of the first events back then, it was called King of the Callers at the Evil Olive. And you were one of the first guys I sat down and, and spoke to. Lee Elsie had introduced me to you. And um, you were a gentleman then. And, you know, we appreciate everything you do for uh, Second Amendment gun owners. Now, Scott, there's a public hearing coming up tomorrow, and it's tomorrow, um, and it's a, a few gun bills are going to be addressed. Tell our listeners what's up for discussion and where to go in order to be in attendance. Um, sure, and uh, you know, and just so your listeners know, uh, with the hearing being tomorrow, it's not too late for them to uh, join us at the Capitol, and it's not too late for them to, to submit testimony online if they can't make it to the Capitol. Or, or if they want to do both. But the, essentially the hearing is uh, uh, March 11th tomorrow, and uh, it uh, starts at 10 a.m. in Room 2C in the Legislative Office Building. And that's uh, right next door to the Capitol. It, that actually connects with the tunnel. And uh, so essentially there's going to be seven bills that are brought up. There's going to be a combination, a mix of bills we're opposing, bills we're supporting, and there's also a storage act uh, one of the bills is a safe storage act that we have uh, offered some amended language through the uh, chief proponent of that that piece of uh, le that legislative proposal that if they include that we will strongly consider actually supporting it so we're trying to find some common ground it has to do with how firearms are stored uh, and uh, but more importantly making sure children are safe uh, from you know finding a gun that is negligently stored because you know it is a parent's responsibility to make sure their their children don't have access to firearms and can harm themselves or somebody else as well. So uh, you know that's that's where we're at. That's that's essentially the the skeleton of what we're looking at for for tomorrow. Scott, um, the bill that is certainly one of the most support, important that will be reviewed tomorrow is the HB five two two seven. Is that what you were talking about just now, or or is that something else? No, that's the regulation. That's um, an act concerning the regulation of firearms by municipalities. That particular bill um, is something that we are supporting. It, it essentially says that once you have a permit to carry firearms in the state of Connecticut, one, if you own a gun legally in the state of Connecticut, that no town or municipality shall pass an ordinance that usurps Connecticut state law. Essentially, we want to make sure that if you own a gun and you are transporting a firearm legally mm. through Connecticut, that you're not subject to any criminal or municipal fines or charges if you should carry a firearm uh, from one town to another, crossing a line, and now you're, you're legally carrying in one town, and now all of a sudden, because some town put out some type of ordinance that you're not breaking the law as you, uh, as you travel. So it sounds a lot like uh, us here in New York where you could be a legal permit holder here in Suffolk County, um, but you cannot travel through New York City. Yeah, correct. This would be a, a statewide preemption uh, type, type uh, law if it should pass. So that's what, that's what we're hoping for in that. Uh, of course, in, a state of, in the state of Connecticut, as like New York, uh, it's very difficult to get something like this passed, but... You know, the hopes are one day that maybe some of the legislators will list, actually listen to the concerns of gun owners and say, you know, this, this person has been background checked at the, at the local level, at the, at the state level, at the federal level. They've taken a safety course. They've legally purchased their firearms. They were background checked when they uh, purchased the firearms through the, the, you know, the transfer. It goes through a, another process where in order to take possession of a firearm, you have to have a, a transfer uh, validated with the uh, with the um, state police. So, you know, I, I don't think it's too much to ask that I'm going out of my way and any other gun owner is going out of their way to, to try to follow the laws that they don't somehow fall into some trap, uh, you know, from one city to, to the next town or whatever have you. Right. Yeah, that's, I mean, because you wouldn't want that to happen because, you know, it's not the intention of the gun owner to break the law in that situation. Right. Right. 
and and many support it. Uh, you know, those that who are, I guess you, you know, we use the, uh, the the language anti-gun. Uh, they're they're essentially trying to make criminals out of law-abiding. Right. Citizens. Well, Scott, does the does the Connecticut safe storage um, bill does it, it does that provide um, any gun owner in the state of Connecticut the ability to have a a single gun unsecured in the home? Because New York's doesn't, and, and the the problem that I think that I have as a gun owner here in New York is that it puts me in undue danger. That if somebody is trying to break into my home, or if they are in my home, and I wake up, I have to now fumble with a safe combination, a key, a touchpad, or something like that mm. to try to get to a firearm that I have legally in my home. Right. Right. Well, there's a disparate impact there, and. and- some of the argument coming from the, the other side right now, the opposition, is that you, you have these small handgun safes, that the biometric safes, where you can at least put the firearm in there. And, and, and um, you know, so, but it, it is a disparate impact on gun owners who would want to defend themselves. But uh, to answer your question, uh, in Connecticut, no, there is a provision in there right now uh, that does allow for immediate control of the firearm to be possessed either on your person or in a manner where in close enough proximity to where you can easily access the firearm to defend yourself. In other words, so that way it doesn't fall into the hands of a, a child or some prohibited person. Now, um, back uh, to more point to more of a, the point with this bill is uh, in 1990 there was an act that passed the original Safe Storage Act in Connecticut, and this is where it gets good. In 1990, uh, 90-144 was um, the original Safe Storage Act had language in there that said that the State Board of Education, uh, in conjunction with the Connecticut uh, State Chiefs, Chief of Police Association, had the uh, ability to craft a curriculum for schools for from through grades kindergarten through age eight and allow for that to be provided through local school boards um, and regional school boards, so that way they could actually implement an ability to teach kids what to do, not, not taking them to the range, but to teach children what to do should they be in a position where they go over a friend's house and they, you know, a kid, they start rifling through a drawer and they find a gun, what to do in that situation. If they're walking to school and there's a gun laying in the bushes on the way to school, to, to essentially very basic information, to not pick it up, don't touch, tell an adult, Walk away from it. Uh, you know, certainly, don't pull the trigger on, on the firearm. There's very basic information there, it's, and it's it's not so much, uh, you know, how to shoot the gun. It, it's it's quite the opposite. In fact, it's how to how to get away and, and how to make sure you don't uh, put yourself in that situation again. So, what happened was, the language was may instead of shall. And so what happened was uh, these two entities, the State Board and the uh, Police Chiefs Association, they let it die. It sat in a dustbin, and we're looking at nearly 30 years of a failure by the original legislature back then to, that passed this act to, to just let it sit there. And, you know, there's been, there have been, uh, you know, numerous accidental or negligent discharges of firearms through the years where, where kids have been hurt and killed in Connecticut as, you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, this, this coming uh, tom- tomorrow with the, uh, the, the hearing over Ethan Song, the, you know, they're, they're calling it, uh, you know, the Ethan's Law. And um, so, you know, he possibly could have been saved had he known better and, and, and known that all guns are always loaded no matter what. If somebody tells you a gun is not loaded, Unless the gun is in part, a part or in pieces, you have to always presume it's loaded. Otherwise, you're playing with you know a deadly weapon right there. Scott, going back to weapons transfer, I was reading one of the bills in here, and I don't know if it's the same one you were talking about, but they use language like assault weapons and large capacity magazines. Um, does this mean that it's they're they're going to regulate you uh, being able to take your gun? Uh, depending on the size of the gun and the size of the magazine, or is this uh, uh, a blanket bill? No, this is actually one of the bills uh, we are uh, supporting. Okay. 
essentially what what it means is if you own what was defined as a an assault weapon, they're not really assault weapons. We all know, right? You know, assault weapons. You know, no military in, in the world uses what's defined as assault weapons under Connecticut state law. You know, an AR-15 is there's there's just no army that would use that as a frontal assault weapon uh, in, in a war. It, you know, the troops would be essentially wiped out by real assault weapons. Correct. So. Essentially, if you have, if you own an AR-15 or one of the types that were banned, and at least one large capacity magazine, you would have the ability to engage in transactions with other people who have registered so-called assault weapons and large, so-called large capacity magazines. Okay. So, so say I own an AR-15 platform rifle, um, which which I made no secret about it, which I do, right. and large capacity magazines, which I do, I am now free to be able to transact with other people. I've already shown by following the law when it passed in, in 2013 that, you know, I've been responsible with, with you know, my, my gun and, and my large capacity magazine, mm. and that, so therefore I should be able to, um, you know, enter into uh, agreements with others and, 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 you know, and buy and trade or whatever. We have Scott Wilson, president of the CCDL, on with us right now. Scott, um, what about the bill to carry handguns in state parks? I think le- I think it might have even been last time that we've we had you on. There was there was an issue with this where people were getting uh, arrested or maybe fined or their guns taken away because they were carrying where they weren't aware that they shouldn't have been carrying. Um, what exactly entails with this bill? Sure, it's you know it it uh, we we brought this up last year as well, and we we you know we we are of the mindset that you know any kind any time you have what what you have with the with the law where you're prohibited from carrying a firearm in a state park or a, a forest or whatever, you are you have created a, this massive gun free zone, and we all know that criminals are not going to follow the law if they intend harm on somebody somewhere at any time because they very simply don't follow the law, a sign or an ordinance or uh, a law against carrying a, a gun in a state park is not going to prevent somebody from doing that. Right. The whole, the whole premise is that they're there to cause somebody harm. And, and there have been plenty of encounters in, in state forests and state parks. You have women jogging in state parks. And just... You know whether or not somebody really actually wants to carry a gun in a state park or forest is that that's one point. But the other point is, if somebody knows you are prohibited from carrying in a, in a state forest or a state park, then they know that you're fair game and that they there there's very little resistance that somebody can offer. So there's no deterrent to stop a criminal. It's just a, it, it just underscores the irrational and illogical belief that anti-gun politicians and uh, and organizations that support these types of policies have. And, and you know, Scott, a person's right to defend themselves is not just for criminal activity. You could be in a state forest or state park and have a rabid an, uh, you know, animal come upon you, where it, sure. which is a situation where you could defend yourself if you were licensed to yeah. carry and defend yourself from this animal and probably protect other people from this animal by dispatching this animal. That, that's very true. And there's the, the bear population in the state of Connecticut is growing. They're, they're walking, never mind state parks or state forests. They're going to, they're going to the people's doors now and trying to get in their houses. Right. And uh, so, you know, but there you can protect yourself. But when you go to a state park or a, a forest or whatever, you're 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 in, you know. So you have your lunch. You have right. You have three legged <laughs> critters, and you have you have four legged critters as well. All right, uh, Scott. So if there are any number of our listeners that want to come and attend, and I know they're being encouraged to, they're asked to submit a written testimony, and then there'd be this lottery that would be used to determine who would be able to speak at the hearings. How does this all work uh, in effect, Scott, for people that are interested in, in attending? Sure. Well, you, you come and, and you get there. Around, I would suggest getting there around 8 o'clock in the morning. And you, you wait in line, and then once you're in line, you, you, uh, you move through the line, and there's a sort of a, a bucket thing where you um, put your name in, and then you um, find out what, what you draw for a lottery number. Now, and then once you've got your lottery number, that sort of gives you an idea of, of when you're going to be, when your turn is going to be to speak. It's 
hearings typically, when, when it comes to gun bills, typically go through the day into the, into the night. So um, we also suggest that people make provisions for you know, a babysitter or somebody to take care of their pet, let their dog out if they, if they really truly want to stick it out. And, um, if, even if you don't want to testify, just come and, and to you know, show moral support stand in solidarity with you know with the, with the 2a side of things uh, you know we always feel good when we're surrounded by like-minded people um, it also provides an opportunity for you to show up and go and visit your own state senator and your state representative and you, you know even if they're not in the building that day because they're not always there every day I mean it depends which which committee hearings are going on or which committee they, they sit on you can go and you can put your name in and, and tell them that you were there and you want to speak to them about any one of these issues. So we, you know, visit our website at ccdl.us. Right on the home page is all the information. We have sample testimonies that people can, you know, I mean, they could essentially copy most of the testimony if they want and put their, put their name in mm. or they can get an idea to base their testimony on, um, you know, for, for all of these bills. And we, we encourage that because right now, you and I both know guys that are, you know, we all know that there's a lot of griping on social media. There's a lot of, um, you know, complaining and, and, and you know, it's, it's like a giant echo chamber at times. But now we have an actual opportunity to contact our state reps, our senators, these committees that hear these bills. Uh, and we have the opportunity to, you know, let them really hear our voices and how we feel about this. So. Don't just be a just don't be noise on social media. Actually, take action and uh, and get in touch with your your elected officials. Scott Scott Wilson, president of the CCDL. Thanks for everything you do, Scott. Sure. And did we have time to just mention that real briefly? The Connecticut Against Gun Violence, the main gun anti gun organization, in Connecticut, are actually sending alerts out saying that they don't believe in education for children in schools, which is something we're pushing and we feel it's important at this point and it should have been done 30 years ago absolutely scott that was scott wilson everybody come back to freedom on deck we're going to be talking about the collapse of venezuela continuing with the blackout it's dragging into its second day and of course they're blaming who else president trump Welcome back to Freedom on Deck on 94.9 News Now and Stimulating Talk. We're going to do a little round table discussion. We've only got a few minutes because Scott Wilson went a little long, but that's okay. Uh, next week, we have Brian Bledsoe, host of Trend Chat, coming back back to the program. It's been a little while. And we have Yasmin Flyers. Now, Yasmin converted to Christianity, and she was a Muslim living in America, and she was actually held at gunpoint by her father for converting to Christianity and we want to get into what it's like growing up Muslim in the United States of America I think it's an important discussion well I'm gonna start with the roundtable discussion here and I just wanted to address the 800 pound gorilla in the room and that's the Democrat Party and the rise of anti-semitic rhetoric coming from some of their new elected elected congresswomen. This is a worry. And the fact that the leadership of the Democrat Party is willing to back these women for some of the most atrocious comments I could ever expect anyone to make about Jews in America should send a clear message to any liberal Jew out there to not walk away from the Democrat Party, but to run away. If you don't think that it's going to get worse in this country, you aren't paying attention. And that's looking away from the past that you will you will be doomed to repeat and it could lead to the death of millions of people it did before exactly. in germany so so think about what you're voting for here folks i was just about to say you know there was a time and you know and and, and, and this isn't meant as offense uh offensive words but there was a time when jews believed uh, uh another evil 
and you know, and and that was the Nazis. And they thought, well, if we just cooperate, they maybe they the the will be fine. Right. And, and and then they were being put on uh, rail cars, and they were put into concentration camps, and gassed, and burned, and everything else. You know, you, you sometimes don't believe the lie. And I wanted to point out something that actually Chet pointed out a couple of days ago that David Duke, the Grand Wizard of the KKK, actually supports Omar and Tlaib. Uh, in their a- uh, anti-Semitic rhetoric. And I just want to know, will they or any of the Democrat leaders disavow David Duke? And David Duke said, Elon Omar is the most important member in Congress right now. Think will, about Right, think about will she disavow? That. Will she disavow David Duke? I want to know. I demand to know, will she disavow David Duke? Well, that's the problem. The, you know damn well the media isn't going to address that. They've already no. You, you oh, don't swept see it, it under I mean, the rug. They, yep, they've already swept it under the rug. No one's going to go after her for David Duke supporting her. And it's not just David Duke. Think about the other people that are supporting her right now. Louis Farrakhan, double standard. We need to come up with a meme for the Dems with with sweeper sweepers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could do that. But um, everybody have a fantastic week. Just keep your eye on what's going on with your elected leaders. I know it's hard. But you can't accept that type of hatred. The false hatred that they're painting on Trump and his supporters is actually happening on the other side of the aisle, and it needs to be addressed, folks. It really does. Uh, Come back next week to Freedom on Deck. We've got another hot gallery of guests, and the topics are going to be great, as always. Have a good day, okay? Take care.